Okay, uh, this is uh, Durwood King um, with ELC 113 Residential Wiring Class. This is our book portion for the week for chapter one. And uh, we're gonna try and see how this goes by doing the book portion online. And then you can ask me questions when you're here doing your shop labs, or you can call me either one or email, whatever you prefer. But um, so that we're, I'm gonna try it this way so that you can have most of your time doing actual hands-on labs. And um, it's a little risk in doing it, doing it this way, but let's, let's see how it goes. And um, you give me your feedback. Do you think you're absorbing it well enough? And we'll find out as we go through this and, um, and we'll make adjustments if we need to. But um, I'm recording this on Wednesday, August the 19th. And um, okay, so we're, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna do some screen sharing, flipping around. We're gonna start out with a, an electrical safety video DVD, just a short, short clip or two here on electrical safety. And um, if you've had ELC 111 before, then you, you, you've probably seen this. You may remember seeing this before, but it's not gonna be long. Um, so we're gonna flip over. Um, okay, and you should be seeing my screen there. We're gonna start it out. Electricity is the flow of electrons through a conductor. A wire is a metal conductor usually enclosed in a plastic insulator. The metal wire conducts electricity and the insulation protects against shorting between touching wires and other objects. A basic electric circuit consists of a power source, usually the generating station, which supplies AC electricity to homes and businesses. A load, which is any electrical device that uses electricity, such as a light bulb, electric motor, or heating element. Conductors, such as wires or metal contacts in switches, carry current between the power source and the load. The conductors carry the electricity out to the load and back to the earth, or to ground. The load changes the electricity. Now let me, let me add a comment here. The the, the red wire in this case is hot. That's what comes from the breaker itself. So there goes your breaker here, I have an end webcam. And where you're tying that in your breaker panel, that, that lug there, that's where that red wire would go, or it could be a black wire. Most time it's black. Uh, but here the hot wire from the breaker is going out to the light bulb, travels through the uh, filament, and then it returns on a white wire. Now we call that neutral. And it is, it, it is neutral. It carries the same current or same number of amps that the hot wire does. So if you have, say, a half an amp going up the hot wire to the bulb, and the bulb draws a half an amp, then a half an amp returns on that neutral wire back to the breaker panel, which is the white wire. And that white wire, when it gets back to the panel, you know that from what you've seen already, that when you open up the panel, you had your, your ground bar on the left, and then your neutral bar on the right, and then there's a tie bar between those. So your neutral does end up getting to ground, and that's what they're referring to here. Um, that the neutral wire is a grounded conductor. It's not the grounding conductor, but it's a grounded conductor. It carries the current back from the load back to the panel, and then it jumps over the ground. Um, so, but an actual ground wire that would be used to ground a light fixture if that one needed a ground on it, if it was a metal fixture, the actual ground wire is called a grounding conductor. Ground, ground with an ing, grounding. So the actual ground wire is considered a grounding, and the neutral wire, since it carries current, it's, you know, it's, it's a current carrier, but it's a grounded conductor. The word ground with an ED on the end, so I figured I'd throw that in. Um, and we'll continue the video. Into another form of energy, such as light, heat, or movement. The term hot wire in house wiring refers to the wire that carries current and voltage to the load. Electricians often use black or red wire to carry 120 volts AC out to the load. Here is a large industrial transformer that steps down power line voltage to lower 120-220 volts AC for residential use. 
240 volt receptacles use larger terminals than 120 volt receptacles, and they are arranged so that only a high voltage plug will fit into the receptacle. Electric shock results when current passes through the tissue of the human body. Your body tissue is primarily made of water and is therefore a good conductor of electrical current. Thousands of poor souls are killed every year because of electrocution. Do not let a live electrical circuit kill you or someone else. Double check that the circuit is shut off before contacting it with your bare hands. I'm going to also add to that, when you cut the breaker off, it's best to put a lockout device on there. There are, there are lockout devices that, that can be used for on breakers. And um, let me see if I can locate one in here. I'll show you some lockout devices in the shop that you can lock out individual breakers instead of actually powering the whole panel down. But um, if you're at home and don't have a lockout device, of course, you know, you would cut it off use a meter to make sure that that breaker, the output of the breaker is dead. You know, check the breaker terminal on the ground and make sure that it is dead. Um, and then when you close the panel up, if there's a way of locking the panel and taking a key with you, do that. If not, tape it up, do something to you know, put a sign up there telling for everyone, do not open the, do not open this lid and do not cut the breaker back on if you're in a location where you just don't have a lockout device. So we, you know, um, you do want to verify with a meter that it's dead before you handle the wiring that the breaker feeds. Um, when working around exposed house wiring, always assume the wires are hot or carrying current and take necessary. Now, another thing here is his gloves are not up, up to date. We're using voltage rated gloves that are rated for a thousand volts. They have the rubber, the, the rubber part that's voltage rated. And then we have the leather protector glove that goes on top of it. So you got the, the electrical protection with the rubber itself. And then the leather keeps you from snagging the rubber and tearing the rubber part that really gives you the electrical insulation. So the leather portion is just to keep you from um, cutting and uh, contaminating the rubber part that, that does the electrical protection on our gloves. So those, this video's got a little bit of age on it, but the, the, the main gist of the video is fine for you to see how electricity flows. Um, Very precautions. With a 60 cycle 120 volt circuit, the amount of current passing through your body will determine the amount of injury. At approximately one milliamp, you will begin to feel the current. At about 10 milliamps, the current may paralyze muscles and you may not be able to let go of the conductor. At only 100 milliamps, the shock could be fatal. Now they just explained the different levels of small amounts of current down in milliamps. Now a milliamp would be, one milliamp is like one thousandth of an amp. And just as comparison, um, everybody knows what a regular power drill is that you know that you would drill with. A power drill, if if it's one that plugs in, can draw on the average of maybe you know three to four amps whenever you're drilling whole amps, not milliamps. So here you're talking that your body is very sensitive to electricity, and at 100 milliamps it could be fatal, which is only 0.1 amps, only a tenth of an amp, and it, it, it as small as it as small as one milliamp you can actually feel that tangle. And around 10 milliamps, you could actually have a muscle contraction that could cause the muscles in your hand to actually clench and you wouldn't be able to let go of, if you happen to, when the contraction happened, if you were happen to be gripping a, a, a hot wire, then you wouldn't be able to let go because the, the current would actually override your muscles and cause a, a contraction there that, that your brain would not be able to override. So that, that amount of current is stronger than than the electrical impulses that come from your brain that actually control your muscles. So your, our bodies are bioelectric in that um, your, your brain sends electrical impulses to the muscles and that's, that's how you actually grip and do things and walk around and move is through little small little electrical signals to go from the brain to the muscles. So um, 
and those signals that are in your body are smaller than say you know when you get around 10 milliamps of current going through your body externally that's actually at a point to where it can override the small signals that are in your body that, was, that, that are going from your brain to your muscles and you would not be able to actually override that so so that's the point of the video is to show you how small amount of current can really be can really be hazardous here um, remember this is only one tenth of one full ampere of power. The amount of current entering your body is primarily dependent upon the wetness of your skin. If your skin is perfectly dry, you will have more resistance to current flow. This can be checked by touching an ohm meter across dry skin, then wet or sweaty skin. The wet skin shows much lower resistance to current flow. If in doubt about whether a circuit is dead, use a test light. Now, back where they were showing you about the testing the, the, the resistance of your skin when it's dry and wet. I'm, I want to cut the screen share off and, and flip over to my webcam. I want to show you my skin dry and then wet and show you the difference. So I'm going to hit stop share. You'll see the screen change now. And now we're back to the webcam. So I'm going to do a brief, a brief demonstration here with a meter um how so i'm going to move the camera just see it move around some here so i'm going to cut this meter on here and we're going to cut it on on ohms now you're going to be learning about how to use the meter but that's one of the settings on there the ohms it looks like a horseshoe setting on there it let's get the uh camera position a little better. Here, the, the ohms, it looks like a horseshoe symbol. And when you flip it to that, you're going to get a resistance reading. It's going to tell you how much resistance that you have in a circuit. between the probes here that are plugged into the meter. So um, let me get a little better angle here. Got some glare on that. Actually, I think I'm gonna move it a little closer. Yeah, that's a little better there. So if you notice on, on, on the display here, we have a, it says OL, that means over limit, which means when the, when the test leads are apart, the resistance that it detects is actually over the limit of, of what the meter can detect. And you also notice in here that it says a large M and then the horseshoe for, so a big M means mega. Now, um, some of you may already know about the, may have already seen the metric prefixes that we use. And um, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll post this in Moodle and I'll give you a paper copy of it. But here we use the metric system prefixes when we do electrical measurements. Like for ohms, if it says a big M and then ohm beside of it, it means mega ohms. So the large M is mega and it means one million. So if we go here to where it says mega, right there, it's a big M. And it means one million, or it means you know, literally one million. So if, if I had one one mega ohm, if it said one on the screen, which it does, and if it said one mega ohm, it would mean one million ohms. Okay. If it said two two mega ohm, then it would be two million ohms. Okay. So the M means mega or million, and if you see if you see the display change over to K. K means kilo or kilo ohms, which means a thousand. So if, and I'm just going to tell you, you're going to see it change to that. It's going to be in the mega ohms when my, when my skin is dry and it's going to switch way down into the kilo ohms when my skin has actually got water on them. So here in the metric uh, prefix sheet, we have um, kilo or K represents a thousand, literally 1,000. So if you say 1K ohm, it's 1,000 ohms, or 2K ohms, it would be 2,000. And also, that same K 
can go in front of in, in front of any unit that you think of, like like in uh, grams, uh, kilograms. You know, you've heard of kilograms. So uh, one kilogram would be one thousand grams of weight. Uh, one kilovolt would be a thousand volts. And one kiloamp. 1K A for kiloamps would be 1,000 amps. So the K mean in front of some other unit means 1,000 of the unit. And it, it's just that simple. So, so anyway, um, just to explain that, in the common, the common prefixes that we use in the electrical field would be, the, the larger one would be Terra. Now Terra, is used nowadays for in, in memory on computers, terabytes. So T means trillion in our system. Now we use a, the short scale in the United States, the short scale names for these prefixes. Some areas of Europe use the long scale. We don't use that and not even all areas in Europe use this, but most of the world is using what we call short scale metric prefixes, the names for them. And uh, so here, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, in most parts of the world, you know, the, the, the Terra, Terra means uh, like, you know, for terabytes in memory on a computer or hard drive, and that would be one trillion bytes of data if you're talking a hard drive. And G means giga, and you know, you, everybody's heard of gigabytes. So G, you know, like with your phones, so many gigabytes of speed or memory, so giga means billion or one billion, you know, one with nine zero. So if you say, um, you know, two gigabytes, it would be two billion bytes of data. You know, um, you know, mega, we used to talk megabytes, but now we talk gigabytes and terabytes. You know, on, even on thumb drives, you know, you, you know, you, you, you see them in gigabytes now commonly, not megabytes. The kilos, you know, it, it's common for voltage, amps, resistance, uh, weight in grams. And then the other, these other ones are not common for the electrical field. You get down into small ones, milli. So the little m, you have a lowercase m, it means milli. Now the uppercase m, you got to pay attention. If it's a big m, it means mega, a million. If you are looking at a lowercase m, it means milli, milli, or one thousandth of something. So it can be a milliamp of current. It can be a millivolt of voltage. So one millivolt would be one thousandth of a volt. And then anything milli would be a thousandth of that thing that you're measuring. Micro is used on capacitors in the electrical field. It's a U with a tail on it. And it it's a Greek symbol that means mu. The Greek letter mu, and it means, and it's micro is what we is what we call it in, in as a prefix, and micro is used in uh, capacitors that store energy in circuits, and you would say microfarads. Farads is the unit that we use for for measuring uh, capacitor um, capacitance. So it would be microfarads, you know, instead of instead of ohms. Ohms is we, what we use for resistance. And farads we use for capacitance, and that's something that you would be getting into later. And then, so then you have nano is a sm very small prefix. It means a billionth of something. Micro means a millionth of something. And then pico, these three are used on capacitors that store energy in circuits. So the even even down as far as a pico pico farad in capacitors would be a a, a trillionth of whatever you're reading of farads or whatever unit that, you, that, you're, that you're reading. So pico means a trillionth of something. It's a, it's a decimal and then, and then all those zeros there. So anyway, the, the ones I have circled are the, are, the, are the most common ones used in the electrical field. And um, I'll get you a copy of this. Those of you that are taking um, ELC 111, you know, you've already got one of these. Um, or, or if you don't, you're gonna get it. So, so anyway. Um, Help me remember to give you one of these um, if you don't have one already, um, okay? Okay, now, so let's do us a quick demonstration on body resistance. 
And the reason we're doing this is I'm going to show you dry skin. Um, what happens? What is the amount of resistance that my body presents to, to electricity? What's the amount of opposition that my body has to it when the skin is dry and then when it's wet? And then you're going to find out when it's wet, the body resistance does go down a lot which means that it would be um, easier for current to get through my body at a particular given voltage, which could cause more internal damage. So the less the resistance of my body is, the greater the damage that can happen with electrical current. It's just like when your immune system is, is low or weak in your body and there's uh, germs and viruses around in the environment, then it's easier for you to get sick. You know, your resistance against disease is like it's another form of resistance you know so um it's this is a very important point here so if you watch the meter is showing right now over limit it can't read the open circuit so it's saying over limit now if i touch both leads you know my left and my right hand there you're seeing that it says point point eight meg ohms point nine meg ohms one meg ohm so it's about my body resistance right now with dry skin is about 1 million ohms. Okay. That's completely dry skin. Now the book says typically for dry skin, the book says anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000 ohms in the book. Now mine is actually double that. So it's not going to be constant from one person to another. It really does have to do with, uh, you know, calluses. Like I play guitar, so... There's, there's calluses on my fingers, and, and so my skin resistance may be higher than somebody else. Um, and then the, the chemical, uh, the state of the chemicals in your body at the time, based on what you ate, you know, has, has, that comes into play also in your body as far as your resistance. So I'm about a million ohms right now, dry skin. Let's see, let's see what happens when I wet my fingers with some water. So all I'm doing is I'm just gonna take a little bit of bottled water here and I'm gonna wet my fingertips just very slightly. Now, so I've got them, I've got them, I've got them damp here. Now you watch the display, and you're gonna see it go down into the K ohms, the kilo ohms. You see, I'm touching the leads here, and I'm down around 250 kilo ohms now, K. Y'all see that little K over there? It's not the M anymore. It's not mega ohms. It's not million, not a million ohms, but it's way down in the 300,000 range of ohms. So um, that is considerably less. It's a whole lot less, which means this is if I have a circuit that's 120 volt, you know, receptacle that I'm dealing with and I'm, I'm working on it, I'm going to change the receptacle out, but I didn't cut power off then and I come in contact with it. If I come in contact with it with dry skin at, at a million ohms, it's gonna do a certain amount of damage to me. Um, but if I come in contact with it with wet skin, it, my body resistance drops and, it, and at the same 120 volts, when that body resistance drops, the current going through me is gonna be higher. And we're, that we're, we're heading into something called Ohm's Law and you're gonna find out that if the voltage is constant in a circuit and the resistance goes down, then the amps goes up. If we're talking the voltage staying the same, 120 volt constant, that, but the resistance changing, going from a high resistance to low, then, then your amps is actually gonna slow down and um, you're gonna have, have a, I mean, if the resistance goes down, the amps are gonna go up. So resistance and, and current are always opposite from each other. When the resistance goes up, the current goes down. And when the resistance goes down, the current goes up. So there, Ohm's law calls that, that they're inversely proportional. So um, current amps in a circuit is inversely proportional to the resistance um, when the voltage is constant. So, okay. So anyway, that's, I figured I'd throw that in. Um, safety is something that it, 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 may, it, may, it may bore some people, but you've really got to focus on it in the beginning on electrical and you've always got to be, you know, we always need to be safety minded. Um, okay, so now I'm going to flip back to, to the video and let you finish seeing that clip there.
We're going to continue the video. Hello. If in doubt about whether a circuit is dead, use a test light or multimeter to check for power. If you have to test a live circuit, use only one hand to reach near the energized components. A current flowing between two hands can be more dangerous than current flowing through one hand, down to your foot and to ground. Current flowing between two hands might flow across your chest, causing heart stoppage. Remember, always unplug power when not measuring voltage or current values. Discharge capacitors before working. Electrolytic capacitors can remain charged after the power is off. Use a grounded screwdriver to discharge large electrolytic capacitors before working. If you touch high voltage current sources, 120 or even worse, 240 volts AC, it will make your muscles reflex, contract, and tighten. This will make your hand muscles involuntarily grasp the conductor even tighter. Even now, going back to the capacitor that he showed. He's showing they're discharging a capacitor by bringing the leads together. That's only okay if you got small ones. Now, when you get on larger ones, like on variable speed drives, on the industrial drives, where the capacitors are huge, you would never do that. It would be it would be fatal. You would have to discharge them with a discharge resistor. It would need to be a device rated for that capacitor. It will be placed across it to to bleed it down slowly and, and safely. So doing a direct discharge like that, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a good thing unless it, they're really small capacitors. And they're, they're doing it barehanded there. You don't even do it barehanded. I don't recommend it. it even though that's a small, he, he's probably got something that's a very low voltage DC that's not risky. But um, as a rule of thumb, it's better to never do it barehanded that way. I always have gloves on if you were going to do a small one that way. Um, like single phase motors, small motors that use capacitors for starting capacitors. Nowadays, you'll see the capacitor that has a, a bleed off resistor actually soldered across it so that whenever the circuit cuts off, it'll go ahead and bleed it down automatically with, with one that's actually strapped across the capacitor. Um, it's what you see commonly nowadays. Um, After the power is off. Use a grounded screwdriver to discharge large electrolytic capacitors before working. If you touch high voltage current sources, 120 or even worse, 240 volts AC, it will make your muscles reflex, contract, and tighten. This will make your hand muscles involuntarily grasp the conductor even tighter. Even more current will then flow through your body, so you cannot let go of the current conductor. If this current reaches the nerves running to your chest or brain, your heart could stop beating and death could result. If someone is being electrocuted, turn the power off quickly. If this is not possible, keep yourself insulated from the person by using wood, rubber, or plastic to try to free them. Don't grab them with your bare hands. After freeing the person, get them medical attention. Okay, we don't need it for high hybrid cars. Um, let's see. Let's skip to the part on residential. Uh -oh. Let's go back. Um, I'm going to switch screens again. bear with me on this. It, 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 there's a little delay between me switching screens. And actually the bottom of my video player is not visible right now. Let me uh, let me go back. I'm having a little little hiccup here with the C in the screen. Bear with me here just a minute.
there. The last section I'm going to skip to is on house wiring safety. This might want to just hang in there with me. I know although you have a lot to do with your personal time. A power panel also called a fuse panel or circuit breaker box, is a large metal box that feeds power to the house wiring through circuit breakers. Electrical service wires from the street connect power to the panel bus bars. Bus bars are large metal conductors running down the inside of the power panel. Circuit wiring is connected to the bus bars using small screws. Circuit breakers snap over the two hot bars to regulate how much current can flow into the circuit. If current accidentally starts to flow near or above the circuit breaker amp or current rating, the circuit breaker overheats and quickly snaps the circuit open to cut power to the malfunctioning or overloaded circuit. An electrical fire is the result of excess current heating and burning wire insulation. For instance, one wire may short to ground. It will then draw high current and begin to heat up. With more heat, the insulation can catch on fire. This can burn through the insulation on other wires. Never replace a blown fuse or circuit breaker with one of a higher amperage rating. This could cause an electrical fire. If the fuse does not blow, Components can overheat and burn because of the high current draw. Electricity is such a ubiquitous technology that it's not just electricians who need to worry about it. But if you put to use the tips presented in this video, you'll know how to work with high or low voltage electricity more safely, whether you're a technician, mechanic, carpenter, or just an average Joe doing projects at home. Okay, so that, that, um, okay, so now we're, we're, we're going to go to our book. Um, well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do something as a preliminary before the book that you may or may not have heard me uh, talk about. This screen here is, is I like to show this before we actually get into the book because it, 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 um, it sort of breaks things down a little better before you even start the book. So let's look at the three, the, the three terms, voltage, current, and resistance. Now, for some reason, my screen is, is um, jumping in and out for some reason, which is unusual. Let's go back up. Voltage, in the simplest terms, would be electrical pressure. So it's the pressure that pushes the, the current through, through the wire. And specifically, when you measure voltage in a circuit, you, you put the meter on, on V for volts, and depending on if the meter has a, a setting for AC volts and DC volts, if it does, you wanna put it on, on the appropriate one if you, if you know what the voltage is in the circuit. If you know it's AC, put it on the AC setting for, it'll say V, and then there'll be a wave on there for, for um, AC voltage. Um, let's, let me show you a close up on the meter. I'll do stop share. Now, so here, just to elaborate on that, if you're checking voltage, this meter has two settings on there. It has V with a wave, and the wave represents alternating current. And I can show you with an oscilloscope sometime, and depending on what classes you've had with me, you may or may not have seen this. But the wave on there for AC, that just represents the, the actual way that the voltage goes in cycles, it goes from zero to a positive peak when it's generated from, from, from the power plant. So they generate it and it goes to a, a peak smoothly and it comes down to zero and then it goes through zero, goes negative to a negative peak and it looks just like an ocean wave going up and down like that. 
And that wave is only one wave that you see. There's actually 60 of those waves every second coming from the power plant. So their generator runs at a speed of 60 cycles per second. And we call it 60 hertz. Hertz is, and it's H-E-R-T-Z, hertz is the unit that we use to measure frequency or how, how frequently does the signal change? How, how frequently does it cycle a complete cycle from the generator? Okay, so um, anyway, so that, that setting there would be for AC voltage. Now, if you were gonna check a car battery, you wanna flip it to DC voltage and it has a V with a straight line, with a dash line and a straight line. And so DC is straight line and, it, and it, it's rock solid at 12 volts or 24 volts or could be 36 volts on a forklift, 48 volts on a forklift, maybe if you're dealing with a, with a battery operated forklift, pallet jack or something like that. If you're checking batteries, all batteries are DC, you're gonna, you're gonna flip there. Now other meters don't have those two settings on there. Some meters only have one setting for voltage. So this basic uh, Fluke T5 here, you know, it only has one setting for voltage, but it says automatic selection, if you see there, AC slash DC automatic selection, which means this is when you, when you flip it to voltage, when it, when it boots up, it boots up by default looking for AC, it looks for AC. And when you connect your, your test leads to your circuit, if it detects DC, then the enunciator is gonna change from AC to DC. It's gonna tell you what it is. You don't have to know what it is. So this, this meter is very simple. It's only got the three settings on there, which is what we're gonna talk about now, volts and then current, which is measured in amps. And then the resistance is the horseshoe that's you know measured in ohms. So you know this this is these, this is the meter that you use um, for now here here at the college, and you get into using the other one later when you get into motor controls. Um, then you get into using a more more uh, a meter that has more more features. So um, anyway, let's flip back to the uh, to the to the sheet. And so voltage, when, when you read voltage with a meter, here, here's what the, the meter's actually telling you. You have two probes here and you would commonly take that black probe and go to ground or go to a neutral. There's a known zero volt point in the circuit. This is the same circuit with the hop that, you, that, you're, that you're testing. So you wanna put your common lead on a reference point in that circuit that's gonna be at zero volts and that can be a ground or it can be a neutral. Neutral is actually the, the, the most reliable one to go to because sometimes you don't have always have a good clean ground depending on if, if the machine has corrosion on it, if it's an older machine. Neutral is always gonna be dependable and um, neutral and ground are tied together on most of the time on machines. But um, if, you, if, every, if, if all of your connections are good, it's okay to go to ground with that reference point there with the meter. But, but the meter needs, it, the meter measures, it measures the, the difference in it, you know, voltage is electrical pressure. The meter tells you in numbers, when you read the voltage, it tells you what's the difference in voltage between the red probe and the black probe. Just always remember that. The, the meter really does a subtraction. It says, the meter, when, it, when the meter, See, you touch two different points. You're touching a, a signal and then a, a, a neutral or a ground. The meter literally does this. It says whatever voltage this is, this one minus this one, it subtracts them. And then it tells you the difference. The keyword's difference. It tells you the difference in pressure, electrical pressure, between those two probes. And that's what it displays on the screen. Um, so voltage, you can hear it be explained as being potential difference. Potential being pressure, electrical pressure, difference being what what some what voltage is this one at, what voltage is that one at, and it subtracts them and that's the answer that it shows you on the screen. So literally that's what it does. Um, so you're gonna get uh, uh, chances, plenty of chances to use the meter 
here at the school in all of your electrical classes. Voltage, uh, we use a, a, a V for volts, it can be an E in, in Ohm's law formulas, and that's electromotive force. Voltage can be compared to pressure in water systems, hydraulic systems, air systems, pneumatics, in a unit that we use called PSI, or pounds per square inch. So PSI, like on your vehicle tire, if you got 35 or 40 pounds of air pressure in your tire, that is pressure of course, for that tire. Voltage is pressure in the electrical system. It's the pressure, okay? So, you know, think about that. And when you think voltage, think about, you know, pounds per square inch in, in uh, fluid power systems in, uh, in air. Current is our next term, and current is not voltage. And you can't, you, you can't interchange those terms. Current is the flow rate of electrical charge per second. So it's really how fast does the current flow. How fast does the electrical charge flow through that wire is the speed, not the pressure. So it's a flow rate, and flow rate can be compared to, in, you know, in water systems, gallons per minute. So if I have a, 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 a water system, and I got water flow into something, a piece of equipment, and it's, I've got maybe you know, 30 pounds of, of water pressure, and I have two gallons a minute of water going to it, going through a machine, then you know the, the gallon per minute is, is the flow rate, and that's like the amps in a circuit. So it's kind of like saying I've got, I've got a, a drill, I've got an electric drill that's running on 120 volts of pressure, and when, I, and when I drill a hole, that drill motor is drawing three amps. So the three amps is telling you the flow rate of the electrical charge per second is what it's telling you the flow rate. Um, so, um, any, and if you break an amp down, it, it gets down into a term called Coulomb. So if you have a Coulomb of electrical charge, one Coulomb per second flow, and that means one amp. So a Coulomb is a, an electrical packet of charge that you don't even see that term in, in, in the residential book, but you can see it in some electrical theory books. But that's the, the breakdown of really what, what is an amp? What is an ampere? and it's a coulomb of charge per second. It, it's a flow rate, and then we call it amp. So one amp is like one coulomb per second of, of, uh, of electrical charge flow. So I hope that wasn't too much there for you. Um, but, um, and then, you know, we, the, the, the unit that we use to measure amps, the unit is, is the ampere, and we shorten it to amps. So ampere is the last name of a French physicist that was named um, after this. He was one of the guys, the elect electrical pioneers back in the 1800s um, that, that defined the units that, that we measure now. They, these are the guys that were in, in the early stages of it that, that um, you know, that were small enough that could, that could define what, what we know today as amps. Voltage was named after a guy, his last name was Voltaire. He was another phys uh, physicist from over in Europe, and um, I forget what country. Um, it may have been Germany or uh, France or somewhere over there, but his last name was Voltaire, so the Volt was named after him. Okay, so it was a, a pioneer there. Um, but on amps, we use a, a for amps, for whole amps, and then for uh, if it's a thousandth of an amp, a fraction of an amp, we use the little m and the big A for milliamps. And you see the I use in Ohm's law formulas that represents current, and the I comes from French for intensity, the intensity of the flow. And that's like saying a uh, picture of uh, uh, a river, a river of water flowing, and however rapidly or intense the river flows, that the flow rate, the, the higher the flow rate, the more intense the river flows, and the more intense the, the electrical current flow is in, 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 a, in, a, in a wire, the, the higher the amps is, the more intense the flow is. So I comes from intensity. And you only see an I used to represent current when you're dealing with formulas. They'll use an I in the place of an A for in Ohm's law formulas. And you'll see that coming up pretty shortly here.
but the current again can be compared to gallons per minute whether you're dealing with water flow hydraulic flow and so on and then um when you're when you're reading current then you're going to put the meter on on um uh, i'll cut the screen share off here when you're reading when you're reading current you're going to switch the meter over to amps a for amps and here you can you can see that the meter on it only reads ac amps this meter won't pick up dc amps you've got to buy a special a special sensing type uh, pickup that'll, that'll pick up dc amps so for automotive type and forklift troubleshooting it will take a more expensive meter uh, that will pick up dc amps but here on this one it's got a fork on there so if you were going to check amps with this one you you would simply put The wire in the circuit has to go in, in, down in that fork like that, so it has to go all the way in the fork there, where where the uh, where that line is, that straight line that's molded into the plastic. So your conductor has to go all the way down in that fork, and then this is a sensing area, and it picks up it picks up the amps by by sensing the magnetic field around that wire. You know, all all, all electricity going through a wire produces a magnetic field, and we measure amps, we measure current in the unit call amps, we measure amps by way of sensing a magnetic field and that tells the meter the intensity of, of the current flow. Um, so, so for checking amps, you know, we're not, we're not gonna use these probes on this meter. It's, it's actually picking it up through a magnetic sensor up here, okay? And, um, so, some meters have, instead of having an open fork that way, they have a closed jaw that actually closes around the wire. And um, I have one here I can show you. So this type of a this type of a meter right here, and uh meters like this can be found can be found at Lowe's pretty commonly. Fluke. Fluke makes a good multi-purpose meter that actually has an amp clamp. So here, a closed jaw clamp takes the place of, of the open jaw fork here. And uh, so this one, you know, you put it, you clamp it around around the wire like that, around one single conductor, not not two or three. But you know, you get that one wire in that in that sensing field there. This is a current uh, coil pickup. So there's coils of wire in there. And that magnetic field, when it gets inside that that uh, that pickup coil there, that the coil is um, there's the magnetic field here induces energy into that coil, and that meter can calculate the amps by the intensity of, of the magnetic field around that wire. So here on this one, you know you have the the amps AC setting here, of course. And this one does not read DC amps, but it'll read AC amps, but it will read AC and DC volts. It'll read, here you got AC volts and DC volts there. But if you're gonna be reading DC amps, which is not real common, you're gonna need to buy buy one. You need to step it up here a little bit more and get one that has the right type of a coil, pickup coil on there. It'll read DC amps. So if you were working on forklifts a lot, um, automotive, um, of course, uh, pallet jacks, things that are using batteries, then you would you would you would you would make sure that the meter that, that you buy that it could also do DC amps. You know, you pay a little more for them and get them that way. Um, okay, moving right along. I know your time is like gold, and, and I know you're tired uh, from um, your day. So let's let's move right along here. Um, now flipping back to the um, let's see back to that screen there. Um, resistance is is the third common measurement in, in, in electrical systems, and resistance is 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 um means the property of a circuit or device that would oppose or slow current down. So resistance we use um. Light bulbs had resistance, heater elements had resistance, motors had resistance, hair dryers had resistance. Um, you know, everything that uses power to do something has some resistance in it. And um, that 
that that causes the current to slow down some. And um, the unit that we use to describe the resistance would be in ohms. Ohms is the last name of George Simon Ohm, and he was a German German physicist. So all three guys that that were named after these terms here, they all of them were physicists, the European physicists that that defined uh, these terms. But this last guy, George Simon Ohm, he's the one that put it all together into a formula that we call Ohm's law, and that's what you're going to see in your book. And they and they name it after him. And um, they said that that for a while that everybody didn't really buy into his formula, but later on it everybody did and it was proven that he was right. Um, if you could picture being back in the 1800s and being the first guy to try to really wrap your head around electricity and, and, and be able to measure and calculate things, um, you would have people that would be skeptical and, and, and he certainly did. But you can look him up, George Simon Ohm, if, you want, if, you're, that, if you're interested in history and also. But ohms is a unit that we use and if, you know, if a heater element or, uh, or a light bulb has, you know, 10, 15 ohms of resistance, that, that's a number you put on it that you can put in a formula and, and use that to calculate how, how many amps that that device would draw at a particular voltage. So, so we use the horseshoe symbol um, for, for ohms. And uh, sometimes you, if, you're, if you're doing formulas, we, use, we just simply use a R. Resistance can be compared to the easiest thing I can compare it to in fluid power would be just a regular ball valve, a handle valve that you can shut water off with or, or go part of the way. So picture you got a water line, a water valve at your house, and you open it up halfway. Then you're going to get a certain flow rate, you know, of water. But if you open it up a little more, you're going to get more flow rate, right? So the position of that valve represents the resistance how much resistance is in that water line so you know if you open it all the way up you've got very little resistance and you've got a lot of flow the maximum that the pump can put out but if you valve if you trim that valve to halfway then you're going to cut that flow rate way down and the pump that's driving through that valve it, it senses it senses some opposition and that resistance is what we're talking about here so for electrical circuits, um, you have resistance in everything, and, and we're going to be looking at that. Light bulbs, again, light bulbs have it, motors have it, heater elements have it. You know, everything has resistance to it. And um, so, anyway, um, you could also you have resistance in a in a pipeline that may have particles built up in it, a drain line that's partially clogged. It slows the flow down of, of draining whatever you're draining. That's a resistance, just a bad resistance, of course. Um, so you've got good resistance and bad resistance. And even in electrical systems, you can have intentional resistance that's built into a device, or you can have bad resistance. So, you know, for instance, if I had this receptacle right here, and I had a loose connection there on that wire, it was loose. And it was starting to arc in there. And, and by the arcing, it's going to cause pitting in there, and it's gonna develop some resistance. And even if you go tighten that up, if you don't clean that connection under there, you just tighten it up where it's been pitted in there, you're gonna have some resistance in there, in that connection. That's bad resistance. It's, it's not what you want. And what that would do is it would actually restrict the amount of current that you could pull when you plug something into that receptacle. So, you know, um, in, the, in the case of electrical connections, you want all screw connections and terminals to be no resistance, zero. You want them clean, tight connections. And wherever anything is loose or arcing, you got to have resistance in there. Um, and then, for instance, if I have a wire that's been uh, crimped really bad, that's been a cut, partially cut, then you're going to have resistance in there to where you didn't have all the capacity of the wire. You know? um, so, anyway, there's. Um, idea of of good and bad resistance so let's let's uh, let's switch screens again and now we're going to go to the book and um and I'm, I'm doing this recording just all in one sitting so that you only got to watch it one time this week and um you can stop it you can stop it at any point and then come back and continue from where you are you know 
so you don't have to watch it all in one sitting particularly. Um, so let's go to our textbook. And let's go up. Go back up. I was down in there for a ways. So this is chapter one in our book, and I did put, I did put a photocopy. I scanned a photocopy of chapter one. If you don't have the book yet, so in Moodle you can go when you go in there for um, the first section you can actually download chapter one straight from the book, but you do need to get a book soon because I'm not going to copy every chapter and put in here. I'll do, I'll do a couple of them, but everybody does need to get a book. <clears throat> and um, if you go to the bookstore and if they happen to be out, let me know. We'll, we will, we will order one and they'll get it in quick. Um, and it, but some people buy from Amazon uh, in, in different places uh, and even get used books in some, some case or the ebook, you, you know, I'd rather have a real physical book myself, but some some guys get the ebook, and um, and I, I get that. I guess that's okay if if that's all you know. If you don't really want to to have the the actual book in your hand. So anyway, chapter one. Now there are three general categories of the electrical hazards that and, and that a residential elect electrician can be exposed to. You can be exposed to electrical shock, arc flash and arc blast. Now you've looked at electrical shock a while ago in the video. And uh, this just shows again what you saw on the video that showed that showed you the current going, you know, going from the hot wire through the load and then back to neutral. It, it's showing you that here. It goes from power source out to the load and then back on your neutral wire. An electrical circuit has a power source, conductors at your wires, and you got a load that uses that power to do something. Here, the human body can become a part of the circuit. You've got water in your body, and it therefore your your tissue is is conductive to a point. Um, so here, the guy is actually got in the circuit somehow, and we've got us a hazard here. <clears throat> there is a relationship between the current, the voltage, and the resistance in a circuit, and that relationship is expressed in a, a basic formula called Ohm's law. And in Ohm's law, you, the current or the amps in a circuit will be equal to the electrical force in voltage divided by the resistance in ohms. So um, in here, here is where they, they, they're representing current with an I for intensity. Now, I don't know why they didn't just use an A, but this is French in origin. So the, the French uh, you know, chose an I in, instead of an A, you know, for some reason. And we, that's what we have to live with. So electrical force V resistance R, not the horseshoe, but R when you're dealing with a formula. So it's going to be, you know, VIR, where I equals V divided by R. And the example here would be, if you had a 120 volt circuit and you had 20 ohms of resistance in the circuit, 120 divided by 20 would be six amperes or six amps. And that's, that's the way that works. Um, this shows the formula put into a triangle, which, which makes it easier to understand. The pie chart gives you every formula that, that you're going to need doing Ohm's law type calculations. But don't look at don't look at the pie chart right now. That can be, you know, overwhelming at first glance. Go down to the triangle at the bottom. E is going to be voltage. It can be an E or a V. In this one, it's E. It's, it means voltage. And and then we have I for current or amps, and R for resistance. Now. The formula that, that you just saw there that said the current I equals voltage divided by resistance. Just keep in mind here, voltage divided by the resistance equals the amps. Let's, let's see that in a triangle. Now, if you, if you take your hand on that triangle and you cover up 
if you cover up the eye, I'm going to put the mouse over the eye, cover it up. Whatever, whatever variable that you cover up out of, the, out of the three, when you cover up the eye and you're searching for I, what does I equal? Well, what it equals is it equals E over R. If, when you see the two letters, one above the other one, it means division, that you divide those two. So if I take, if I cover up I and I don't know what I is and I'm, and I'm solving for that in, in, in a formula, then I cover the I up and then the formula is I equals E divided by R, the voltage divided by the current, which is the 120 divided by the 120 volts divided by the 20 ohms gives you the six amps that it just showed you there in the book. And by the way, there's, a, there's actually a typo in the book unless, unless your book has been fixed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the screen share off a second here. And I'm gonna move the webcam over to my textbook and I want you to, I want you to look at something here in this book. So if your book, when you go to page five in your book, page five, it says, in the, the book said 12 volts, but it's supposed to be 120 volts. So make yourself a note there that we're, if your book says 12, add a zero to it, it you know, and, and it's gonna be 120 volts. In that example, 120 volt divided by 1,000 ohms would equal 0.12 amps or 120 milliamps. That's a different example, talking about a drill you know, a person that has, has, has a drill, you know, an electric drill. So we're going to look at that in just a second. But I, that, that your, your new books, that may be, that may be correct. Get in there. But, but take a look now on page six and see, see is your book right or not? You know. Go back to the book again. So that, that is the first example of looking at Ohm's law. Now, if you go, let's take a look at that same triangle in two other ways of looking at it. Now, let's say, for instance, that you knew what the voltage was in a circuit and you knew what the current was or the amps, and you didn't know what the resistance was and you were solving for that, like, you know, um, like you would be asked in, in, in uh, Introduction to Electricity, ELC 111, we, we do a lot of calculations in that class. And, and yeah, that's something that you're going to be doing if you're, if you're taking that class. So for resistance, if I put the mouse over the R, and I'm going to say that that's unknown in this circuit, I don't know what it is. You cover up the R with your hand, and then the formula that you use is what you see to the left of it. It would be E over I. So the voltage in the circuit divided by the current or the amps would end up giving you the resistance in that circuit in ohms. So R would be equal to E divided by I. Okay, you got that? Cover up the R, cover up the one you're solving for, and the formula is, is what's left. It's E over E over I. In, in this example, uh, you know, if you, if you were to use, plug in those same numbers that, that were shown in the slide before this, if I said that I didn't know what the resistance was in this circuit, but I said I know I got 120 volt and six amps, 120 volt, six amps, and we go to the next slide there, if I plug in 120 right there where E is, and I plug in six amps right there, and I don't know what R is, if I say 120 divided by six, it's gonna give you what? It's gonna give you the 20 ohms. So that's the way, that's your second way of looking at it, the Ohm's law triangle. The third way would be this, is if you said, I know what the amps is in the circuit, I know what the resistance is in the circuit, what should the voltage be across that device. If I said I got a device with 20 ohms and I got six amps flowing through that device, 
what would the voltage what what voltage would I measure across that device if it was a you know the light bulb or a heater element or whatever that load is and I and I said I got the the, the six amps 20 ohms resistance in that in that device what should the voltage drop be across it well look if I cover up the E if I cover up the E then the formula is actually below it, which is the I beside the R. Now, when you see two letters beside each other in, in, in a triangle like that, you have to multiply those. So E would be equal to what? It would be equal to I times R. The voltage in a particular circuit or section of a circuit would be equal to the amps times the resistance in ohms. So the amps in this case was what? six amps and the ohms was 20. So look, six amps times 20 ohms is going to equal what? 120 volts. So that's how you use that triangle there for basic ohms law. Okay. Now the, the triangle came from the pie chart. So if you take a look, I'm going to show you where each formula out of the triangle came from the pie chart. Let's take the, 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 we just right now we say that we know that I equals E over R, right? I. So let's go up to the pie chart. The pie chart has an I in there, and we're going to treat that pie chart as a pie, like a piece of, like a whole pecan pie or a peach pie, whatever, you, whatever kind of pie you like, chocolate pie. You're going to slice that pie in quarters. One quarter of that pie is going to be for calculating amps or current. So this quarter of the pie, if you're solving for I for current, there are three different formulas that you can use to find the answer to current I. And the first one would be E over R. Okay, so that's where the E over R equals I here. E over R in the triangle equals I when you cover up I. So you know, and then there's other ones with P. P is wattage. Now, we're going to save that for another time, but wattage is P. And you, if you knew the wattage and you knew the voltage, then you could say the watts divided by the amps. I mean, the watts divided by the voltage in a particular circuit, and it's going to give you the correct answer for amps. And then the other one is, is more advanced. If you had wattage and resistance, you would divide wattage divided by the resistance, take that answer, get the square root, and it would tell you the amps in that circuit. It's the same number that would come up in these other, these other formulas. They're all going to give you the same exact number. It's amazing how that works, but you know, these guys way back in the 1800s you know, are the ones that figured all this stuff out. You know? That's why they were... Uh, you know, they, they tagged their name to it because they're, they were that, that smart, you know, so, okay. Anyway, the, the other formula would be is if you, if you, um, if you're searching for resistance, R, look over here, the, the lower left quarter of the pie shows three different ways of calculating resistance in a circuit. And the one that we looked at here, R here, if you cover it up, equals E over I. So R here equals E over I. That's the main one that we're going to be using now. There are two other formulas that, that will give you R resistance. If the variables that you have are voltage and wattage, you could use, you know, use this. The voltage squared over power watts gives you R. Or the power in watts divided by the square of the current. So if you said amps squared and said wattage divided by amps squared, it would give you resistance. Now, we're not going to do all that in this class, but we, we do use it in ELC 111. So if you're taking ELC 111, you're going to use all of these formulas, and it won't be long. When we, when we get Chapter 2, Chapter 3, it's going to be a bunch of this calculating going on, and you're really going to get a good, good handle on this stuff at that point. So anyway, and then the third one, how it comes from the, out of the pie chart will be this. When you're solving for E down there, you cover up E, E equals what? I times R. When you cover up the E, it, then it's the bottom that tells you the answer. So E equals I times R. Come over here. 
the lower right quarter of the pie gives you three ways to calculate for E for voltage. And the one we're using in the triangle would be the I times R. So E here equals I times R. And so that formula fits right into here. E equals I times R. So the triangle is easy to remember. The pie chart, I don't know anybody that's got it memorized, honestly. Um, but I've got, I've got business cards with my name on them. And on the flip side of the business card, if you remind me, I can give you a little pocket card that's got all these formulas on the back side of it. Um, somewhere I've got them in here. Right now. I'll show you right now. I've got them. So this, I'm going to cut screen share off just for a second, let you see my, my, my cool card here. That's my, my business card here for the college. So remind me to give you one of these. It's got my office number on there, and we can also add my cell number. But on the back of it, check this out. I've got all them formulas in there, the triangles and everything. And uh, what gave me that idea was there's a company called General Refrigeration, and, um, and they, they give out Ohm's Law cards. And I said, I want that on the back of my business card. So, I mean, I got Dan, Dan Grubb, and he was uh, doing publicity here and handling marketing and all. I got him to put all of that on the back of my uh, business card. So, remind me, I'll give you one of these, and you'll always have it. It's, it's really cool. Um, so, uh, I'm going to put these on my book cart to, you know, so that I won't forget them, but you know, just remind me to give them to you. And um, you never know when you may end up somewhere out in the field or on, or on a job interview and, and this, this stuff can pop up when you least expect it. Do you need it? You'll always have it on you. So, uh, okay, moving right along. Um, let's see, go back, um, back to the uh, chart. So let's move, let's move on along from here. This is coming from, from chapter one again. Their rough uh, estimate would be for dry skin to be 100,000 ohms to 500,000. You saw mine was about a million, double that. So it can vary a lot. Sweaty hands, a thousand ohms, and mine was a whole lot. Mine was in the kilo ohms, right? Way up higher than that thousand ohms. So it, you know, but but it wasn't sweat. Now it was just plain spring water out of a bottle. Now sweat is salty, which is going to be more conductive. So salt, uh, sweaty water is going to be lower ohms than plain water. You know, the minerals in the salt. You know, the, the it's salt itself. So, you know, it can vary. Sweat is going to really bring your resistance down to electricity. And if you were completely wet, so, you know, then they're saying 150 ohm body resistance. Okay. The, the different effects of different milliamp levels through your body you know, are this. That is in keeping with pretty close to the video. If you got less than one amp, no sensation, one, one, one milliamp. At one milliamp, you can feel a little tingle. Five milliamps, slight shock, but not painful. Most people can let go. Strong involuntary reactions may lead to injuries, which could mean you have a jerk reaction if you're on a ladder and you're working on a light and you get a tingle of around five milliamps. It could make you actually fall off the ladder, break a bone or die just from an indirect accident. I mean, I know someone that was found dead at they had a ladder at home and uh, working on a light fixture and they were found later on the floor dead. And I, I never really heard what happened there. It was out of state, somebody I know from, from up north. And um, I never heard really what caused him to fall if they figured that out. Uh, so, And if you have anywhere from 6 to 30 milliamps, you can definitely feel the shock and it may be painful and you could experience a muscle contraction which would cause you to hold on and again the um when you get around 
when you get somewhere around, you know, around six milliamps and up, six is that number in there to where it's actually stronger than the bioelectric signals in your body. So your brain and your muscles are really not able to really overcome that it, around six and up, six milliamps, way on down there, which ain't but uh, point, point zero zero six amps, you know, six thousandths of one amp, which is a little small bit. Um, you know, you've got electrical signals in your body that, that, that's all the time going on, you know, even your nerve endings that send sensory information from your nerves up to your brain, that stuff is bioelectric, you know, it's, it, that is. And then the, the brain controlling muscles, you know, that's also bioelectric. And the external electrical current around six milliamps and up really begins to do an override to, to your muscle control. And that's what we're talking about. So we want everybody to have a good long life, make plenty of money, and and, and have a good life like you want to have. So uh, let's let's try to be careful. Around fifty, uh, from fifty to one hundred fifty milliamps, it could be painful shock. Your breathing could stop. You might have severe muscle contractions, and you could die. And then around a thousand milliamps, which is equal to one whole amp. You remember one milliamp is a thousandth of an amp, so a thousand milliamps is where it becomes a whole amp. So from one amp to 4.3 amps, you can say it that way, you know, or a thousand to 4,300 milliamps. You can have heart convulsions, a ventricular fibrillation where your heart begins to quiver and it doesn't pump, but it just shakes. It's just in, in a shaking uh, motion but it's not in a pumping motion. It's not pumping, it's just sitting there vibrating because of the electrical current has got it confused. Um, paralyzed breathing usually means death. And then 10,000 milliamperes or 10 amps, cardiac arrest, severe burns, and death is, is probable. And um, so that's, this is not to scare people, but it, but, but, but we do need to be, you always need to be cautious when you're working on electrical circuits and use every safety measure that, that, that you have, be careful. And, it's, and, and you, you're you better off to not work by yourself. Try, try to have somebody around if, if possible. It's not always possible, but, but try to if you can. And always let somebody know where you are if you're by yourself working on something electrical. Let somebody know where you're going and how long you're going to be gone and, and make sure you got cell phone communication with people, you know. Uh, maybe even when you get where you're going and you're going to do a, do a job, call somebody and say, well, hey, I, I, I made it. I'm on such and such a place out here in the country. I'm going to work on the electrical circuit out here and I'll probably be here 30 minutes. And if you don't mind, check on me after a while if you don't hear something back from me, you know. Do some accountability like that. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it could pay off. Here, this is uh, showing the metric prefixes again, and I need to give you a copy of those. Um, set up a note here. I'll have you some copies um, for that. All right. Now, moving right along. Here they have an example of an electrician that's using a faulty corded drill. That something went wrong with the drill. It, it Maybe it, the, the, the drill motor shorted out on the inside or the power cord might have got shorted. It's a hot, humid day. The, the electrician is hit, sweating heavily. And according to that chart, Previously, they're, they're guesstimating that somebody's really sweaty. It's got about a thousand ohms of resistance in their body. Using Ohm's law, the, the volts over the ohms gives you the amps. They're calculating there that that, that guy would have, or that person would have, 0.12 amperes or 120 milliamps of leakage current going through their body. So the 0.12 is in whole amperes, and the way you can convert amps to milliamps would be to move the decimal point three places to the right. If you do that, 
then it converts that number into milliamps, 120 milliamps. And if you convert milliamps back to amps, you take the decimal that would be at the zero and go three places to the left and then drop the little m and it becomes 0.12 amps. Okay, so, so at that amount of current, it says that it could be painful shock, his breathing can't, could stop, and there could be, there, there will be severe muscle contractions and death is possible. Okay, so if you take a look there, 120 milliamps, and we go back to that chart there, 120 milliamps, you're in that range, and you could actually die from it. It could, you know, so it's, it's a serious thing just off of a power drill. You know, when, when you have a faulty drill or faulty uh, cable cord, it could be, it could be fatal, okay. Um, now, the next hazard could be, what, uh, arc flash is another one that can happen. And that's to where you can see a, if something goes wrong in a circuit, you can have uh, uh, circuit wires uh, coming together by failure of insulation or loose wires, but you can have a hot wire in a, in a ground or hot in a neutral or two hots coming together, and you can have a flash, an arc flash. It's very, very hot. It can be, you know, as high as 35,000 degrees. You can uh, burn skin. It can be, it can be very deadly. Um, so we, you know, we're wearing the electrical gloves and the arc flash jacket at school, the arc flash helmet when you have an open panel. If you got an open box where there's not a cover on the switch box, have your gloves on so that there's no way to get shocked there. We'll take a quick look at, at uh, a brief video of what an arc flash looks like, arc blast looks like on a real um, electrical box. So I'm going to switch to screen again and take you to a YouTube video that's only just, just a short, just hang, hang in here with me. And again, if you're running out of time, you can um, you know, stop it and come back and watch, continue and watch it later if, you, if you're running out of time. So um, by you doing this, watching this on your own time, you're getting all of your time here at school on your labs, which is what you need. Uh, you need this too. Uh, so, okay, so um, I'm going to do a screen share with uh, YouTube. Let's see, where's my YouTube at? Back to there. Now I've got I've got to resync my YouTube again, so just bear with me here. There we go, right there. Now you should be seeing a YouTube screen. I'm gonna go full screen with it. And watch closely here. That box over there is a it's a 30 amp disconnect that could be used, you know, on a small circuit. You know, it's not not a very big uh, box there, disconnect box. And I uh, just watch what happens. Let's take a look at what happens when an arc doesn't sustain. We have a 30 amp disconnect with the door open here and an arc that is less than one cycle, six tenths of a calorie. In real time, you don't see much if any fire and little or no molten metal, but in slow motion, we're gonna get a completely different appreciation for how hazardous this event really is. This disconnect is really no larger than a toaster oven that you'd have at home, and yet in slow motion, you can clearly see how hazardous this event is. The arc flash itself projects over three feet, and the molten metal is being thrown five and ten feet in more than sufficient quantity metal. to ignite non-flame resistant clothing. And again, this is despite the fact that this is a very small piece of equipment. You see the, the, the red metal just coming out of that box there, so that, you know, it disintegrates, it gets so hot it actually melts the metal pieces that are in that box. So. Um, it can be it can be very fatal when something goes wrong in a box, um, and so we, we, that's the reason behind that you need personal protective equipment on, and um, and we just need to be careful with our circuits when we're, when when we're looking at things that are that are energized to be to be careful. Um, and a very brief duration arc. Okay, there's. There's a lot of things that you, you could look at on YouTube that are way more dramatic than that. And I'm, I'm not one that's gonna sit here. I'm not one that's gonna give you 
sit here and spend a lot of time showing you a lot of catastrophic things on there that, that can happen. That's just that's just a little a glimpse of what things that can happen. It can be worse too. Uh, so um, let's go back. I'm going to try to hurry up and get through this um, this chapter. I'm trying to do it all in one sitting on Wednesday because Friday the school is, is closed for the most part. And um, so um, anyway, that that's you know was our little thing on that. And um, there there are classes that can be took that are nothing but arc flash classes that specialize on all of the the, the PPE that you wear and all of the ways that, that you know all of the there's a whole lot that goes into being educated on it. And uh, you're just getting a, a, a little intro to it here. Um, the the companies that you go to work for, they like a Butterball, if you go there, they actually do Art Flash 1 and 2 training there in-house. So, and then you have to go through both of those to be able to go inside of the panel. So, depending on the company itself, they would give you further training on this, very specific to their, um, the risk in their panels, you know, how, they, how, how powerful the panels are, you know, some of those outfits that you wear looks like a space outfit. Some of those have a bubble that goes over your head, a balaclava that goes over it that covers your neck and everything. It, it gets very, very, uh, the suits get really big and very bulky depending on the voltage and the current that's, that, that you're in contact with. Um, so what we have here at school is, is small compared to that. You know. Now, the National Electric Code, which is, which is a book that we use to get our electrical codes. And that's a copy of it right there. And you can see it online. You can actually view this online for free. I'm gonna show you how to go online and, and actually look at the book and not have to pay anything. I prefer having a paper copy of it myself, um, but, but it is free access online. It, it's, it's published by the NFPA, the National Fire and Protection Association. The NFPA came out in the late 1800s as a result of a lot of fires up north in mills where the first plants that were set up were mills up north that had electrical wiring in them. There were a lot of fires back in the late 1800s. A lot of buildings burning down because of uh, improper wiring uh, you know, reasons. So the National Fire Protection Association, they formed electric codes. And so you have elect electrical engineers that work for them that, um, that specify codes. And, and that's what that book is full of codes that, that gives you, um, you know, uh, that tells you what size wire to use for so many amps and all that. And it, it gives you guidelines on picking the proper wire, proper devices, for safe electrical installations. It doesn't tell you how to do the work, it just gives you the guidelines on um, picking, again, the right size wire, the right size breaker, right size fuse. Um, it's information on doing the installations, you gotta know how to do the installation, but in there you get the, you know, the charts and all that that you use to pick the right things to use, to use. Uh, it, they, up, they update that code book every three years. It's on a three-year cycle. Here in North Carolina, we're using the 2017 version currently, and the 2020 version is, is, is printed, but, but it hasn't been adopted in North Carolina. That, that happens in Raleigh through, through, through being voted in, and I don't even see it on the, being, being um, in a process of being adopted yet. But it will be at some, you know, at some point they'll they'll begin to look at it and and, and consider if they're going to adopt the entire 2020 version, the code book. And uh, what they did on the on the 2017 is they adopted most of it, but then there were certain certain little sections in there that they didn't adopt. And that's the thing that they can do politically; they can do that. And um, what they did is they had amendments, so they had certain sections in the code book of the 2017 that. They, they wanted to revert back to the 2014. And so then you have to buy the 2017 code book and then you download the amendments 
from the North Carolina State Amendments, and then you find out what sections of the code book that they didn't like of, of the changes, and then where they reverted back to 2014. So it's a, it's a complicated thing. It's, you know, bottom line is, is you would, you know, you, you would need to download the amendments and then kind of see, does any of that have to do with anything that you do, you know, in, on, in your field of, of electrical work? And then just kind of look at the things that, that, that are going to affect what you do and don't worry about all of the, the things that they, that they, that they amended. Um, so anyway, that it's called, but that electric code book, some of you are, are going to be serious enough about this that you, you, you'll want to dig into this. And the, the number of the book is put out by the NFPA, and they put a lot of code books out. But this is called the 70. It's the NFPA 70 code, uh, electric code book. And they put out fire alarm codes. They put out building codes. They put out codes for it, – it's a, a really long line of codes they put out of different books. But the 70 is the one that for, for – uh, for an electric code. Okay, so just keep that in mind there. Um, an overall view of the code book would be this just at a quick glance. Quick glimpse. In the beginning of it, it tells you the history of the code book, it tells you the contents and the committees. The committees are all of the huge number of electrical engineers that put their part into that code book. It was not a one man thing. It was many, 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 many engineers all over the U.S. that had, that were assigned sections in the code book to, to, you know, to do. And, um, and so it, it's unreal how many are in there when you look at that, at that section. And then there's an article in mining in there and this, um, you, you go on to chapters one through nine, one through nine is really the, the, the gist of the code book you'll be looking at. So if I, if you break down chapters one through nine on the next slide, just watch this, I'm gonna click forward. Chapter one through nine is the main area that you would be, that you would be getting into. And I'm just gonna keep this brief here. Chapters one through nine. Chapter one through four are for generally to all electrical installations across the board, it's, it's for most things. Chapter one is general electrical codes. Chapter two is for wiring and protection. Chapter three, wiring methods and materials. Chapter four, equipment for general use. Then you get into another section here for special uh, places. Chapter five, special occupancy. So here, chapter five through seven is gonna be for places like a gas station, a hospital, movie theaters, airports, um, you know, mar marinas where, where you have boats docking in, special places that have special codes that you're not going to find specialty things up in, in the first four chapters. So um, it's amazing, really, how much is in that code book. And there's a there's a section for pretty much anywhere you can think of. Um, and, and especially, and also for special, and then uh, beyond seven here, ch chapter eight is on communication system, telephone stuff, cable TV, and all that. And chapter eight is not subject to the requirements of one through seven, unless it's specifically referenced in chapter eight. So if you're working with cable TV, um, telephone, that would be the, the big one right there, chapter eight. And chapter nine's got a lot of tables in there that we all use. You know, tables on um, that can tell you how many wires can you pull in a certain size conduit and, and beat and be uh, and beat code. So here um, I can take just a brief second to show you how to go online to the NFPA and get free access to the code book. So I can, I can take a minute to do that. I know you're, I know you're probably getting real tired. But again, if, you, if you're out of time, stop the video and just come back and watch it when you get more time. Uh, but try to watch the whole thing, it, it, you know, it, if it, even if it is in a couple of settings. But you're gonna go to www.nfpa.org, National Fire Protection Association, 
and you're going to hit click sign in and then, and then you're going to hit create a profile if, if, you, if you've not set up a profile yet. And then it lets you, it lets you look at electric code for free. So I'm going to take a brief second here and you'll see my screen stop here. And let's go to, um, going to go out to the um, internet here and all I'm going to do is um, pull up uh, www.nfpa.org and that you got the dot org down there so you can just hit that Now, hopefully you're seeing that. Now, this is the homepage for the National Fire Protection Association. So if you, if you, um, and actually I'm actually signed in. Let me sign out and then come back in. I'm still signed in. So for you that have never gone on this website, you want to go to where it says sign in there. And you can either sign in or if, you, if you've never been in it and had set a profile up, you're going to set, you know, you're going to create a profile. So um, you have a, to create a profile, you're gonna go over there where I'm waving with the mouse and you're gonna give a few pieces of information. It doesn't cost you anything, it's free. Just giving, you know, create a, a username and, and a password and then you can get free access to all the codes, whether it's electric or fire alarms or any, any kind of code you wanna think of, you know, you can get in there. So, so let me get in there now and I'll show you how to find the code book and then I'm gonna back out. Um, okay, give me one more. Let's see. So you see it going in. So I, I'm signed in now. And then you can go under um, codes and standards. So you, you would go into there and a list of list of NFPA codes and standards. Click that. And, and, and look at here, you got an NFPA code one for fire code, hydrogen technologies, um, you know, fire protection mobile phone i mean it's it's unreal sprinkler systems let's go on down to the 70 did you find out that, that that this organization's got a lot of code books it's, it's unreal really i didn't know there was that many come on down to um there's one on natural gas um now it, national electric code is the nfpa 70. so you go down to the 70 and you can hit free access. Now, it, you choose your edition. Now, it, right now, North Carolina is under 2017. The 2020 is available. But if you want to look at 2017, you know, you, you click there and hit view. And then you agree. Um, to their terms there as far as that you're not going to try to copy stuff and there you go there goes the code book the, the whole code book and you can hit table of contents at the bottom and you can go through the entire code book and when you click it's going to take you straight to a particular article uh, that you would be looking at so um, I'm going to keep that there and flip back to the book and again it's free um, it doesn't really work that well on a, on, on, on a smartphone as far as flipping page to page. It's a little bit clumsy. But on a computer, it, it works very good on a computer. Um, that's why I recommend having an actual code book, a paper, paper copy of it for, for being in the field. Um, and again, because on, on, on a smartphone, the way that the, the pages show up sometimes are not it's, not, it's not as easy to read on a smartphone. Um, 
Okay, stop. I'm going to uh, uh, flip right back the book. And we're, we're getting close to being done with the book here. Just bear with me. Um, and there's there's an adoption map that the NFPA, you can, you can Google it, the, the NFPA uh, adoption map. It'll show you the whole United States and it'll tell you what state is using what year of the code book for the electric code. So if you ever wanna know what, what, what year cycle are we in in North Carolina, you can hit adoption map for electric code and, and uh, NFPA 70 adoption map. And then you can see you know, what states are using what codes. Down south, like Louisiana, somewhere down in there, they're using like really old code. They they haven't even adopted 2014. Some of them are still on 2011. Um, and legally, they can do that because it's it's a legal thing that the codes are not law unless they're made law by a local authority. So all your states are using electric code, but some of them are like on old old code books because they they just have it agreed on going up on code, and it's a uh, you know, you, you would think we all had to use the same code, the same year cycle, but uh, it's not. It, it has to be voted in uh, by law. So here, in, this is in chapter one, and here's just one example of an area of one topic in the code book that's important. And we're talking about ground fault protection, which would be, you know, these receptacles that we use in our bathrooms, kitchen sink area, outside garages places like that the the these ground fault receptacles they will actually trip they got a little breaker in them and they'll trip if it thinks that that there's leakage current that that you know current that went out from that receptacle to maybe a hand drill and some of the current didn't come back so it, it measures that the the difference in current between between the black wire on that receptacle, it actually measures the amps on the, on the hot wire, what leaves the receptacle going out to your drill, and then what comes back on that neutral. It actually compares the amps on that receptacle, what goes and what comes back. And if that hand drill drew three amps going to it, this GFCI receptacle, it's going to be expecting three amps to come back. That little narrow slot there is your hot. Now, if it, if it put three amps out to a hand drill, it's going to be expecting three amps to come back on that neutral, that whole circuit there. But if some of that current's missing, then that GFCI, that little breaker in there, is going to trip. So it trips on, it doesn't trip on, on overcurrent, it trips on current that's actually missing that didn't come back. So it's actually looking for um, leakage current that, some amount that went out but did not come back. It, it, it wants to see the amps matched on these two wires here, you know, on your black wire and your white wire on, on your receptacle. It wants to see the same number of amps come back as what it sent. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, the, the circuit, the, the GFCI, what it does is it actually trips. It actually trips when it sees somewhere around four to six milliamps of current that did not come back. So if you're missing, if you're shy on the neutral current coming back by somewhere around four to six milliamps or better, then the breaker in here is gonna trip and it's gonna shut power off on that receptacle. So it, this, this, this is not a, uh, this doesn't replace a regular breaker. This actually picks up uh, the, it knows that there's current missing that didn't come back. This circuit breaker actually trips on, that's a 20 amp breaker right there. This one, the only time it trips is when you get above 20 amps in a circuit. So it's for overcurrent protection, not leakage current. So, so you need a breaker ahead, ahead of the GFCI. It takes, you know, it takes both of those unless you buy, um, you can actually buy a combination breaker that's got GFCI protection in it that has both. But you know, if you have ordinary breakers, then you you know, and 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 then for your receptacles would need to be GFCI in around sinks, bathrooms, outdoors, garages, crawl spaces under the house, and all like that. So, I'm not going to hold you much longer. 
the buttons on there, you have a test button and a reset button. You, you can hit the test button and, it, and it'll make it trip. And you can make sure that it does trip. And then the reset button would actually cl uh, clear the fault and, um, and, and reset it so you got power as long as the fault has been removed, as long as you don't have leakage current on, on, your, on your circuit. The your guidelines for telling you where do you have to have a GFCI receptacle can be found in the code book, section 210.8. Now I'm just going to show you online where we were with the, with the electric code, how to find it online, how you can find it without buying the code book. Um, so uh, make a mental note here. It says that all of your 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacles that are installed in bathrooms, they must have GFCI. And also, those same receptacles in a kitchen countertop must have GFCI protection because you're near water, right? Okay, so let's go, let's flip to the code book real quick here. Make a middle note, 210.8a. We're gonna go back. I, I left the code book open online. Um, here and if you see here we're going to go down in our if you hit table of contents on, on the website for the for that code book table of contents and go down to uh 210 and we're going to go to 210.8 believe that's right kind of late Yeah, 210.8. So we're going to hit um, next. And when you hit next, it looks like you're flipping a real paper. That's pretty cool how it flips. So 210. Back. It's kind of going to be small on your screen, but you can you, you can look it up yourself there. But see here, it says 210.8, ground fault circuit interrupted protection. This is where it comes from for the actual code book. So this is an excerpt from that, that goes in our textbook from the real code book. It tells you right here just what the book just said right there if you look. All of your 125 volt single phase, 15 to 20 amp receptacles in these locations, A1 through 10, shall have ground fault. Bathrooms, garages, accessory buildings that have a floor located at or below grade level that are not intended as, as habitable rooms and are limited to storage areas, work areas, and areas of similar use, and outdoors. Crawl spaces under the house. There, there's been people to die under the house where you had a light bulb, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a light a fixture under the house, a bulb screwed in for people to do, you know, if you're doing heat and air to go up under and see under the house. There's been people to be electrocuted and killed under a house because a light bulb broke and then they maybe tried to, 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 to unscrew it and put another bulb in there and they're laying on the ground, got they, their whole body's got contact with the ground and they're sitting there with a broken light bulb trying to change it or whatever the case is and they get electrocuted they get killed because of coming in contact with a light fixture under the house in a crawl space so you got to have gfci on the lighting circuit if you got light circuit or plug-in under the house unfinished portions of a basement um, bathrooms kitchens and rooftops so if you got a building that has a receptacle or so, you know, anything on, on, on top, maybe for um, maybe for air handlers or something like that, and you got a receptacle up there for service people to use to plug something in, then it has to have GFCI if you got them on a roof. And um, sinks, wherever you're going to install receptacles within six foot of a sink. And so, as you see, the code book gives more detail than our textbook does in this chapter. Now, later in our book, it's going to pull more of this code stuff in there. Garages, service bays, other similar areas. 
showrooms. Um, anyway, boat boat hoist. So if you're dealing at, at a marina, you got to have GFCI there. Dishwasher branch circuits. So as you see, there's a lot of places you got to have GFCI protection. And if you if you're working with anybody, um, if you're if you're doing a wiring job for someone and it's going to be inspected by a county inspector. Believe me, that guy knows his code, and, and he, you you know, you get rejected on an inspection if you don't have GFCIs where they're supposed to be. So, uh, anyway, let's exit out of this. I'm just that's just an example. Um, if you go back to table of contents, we go back first, and then hit table of contents. Um, from that point there, you can find any section of the code you want to and go straight to it. You know. If you're looking up wire sizes, you can go in conductors for general wiring, 310. You go there, and I'll show you the most popular chart in the code book on wire sizes. Now, right here, and it didn't take much to get to it, as you see. You go to, to 310, chapter three, article 310, wires or conductors for general wiring, and this chart, is one that I give y'all here in class, a paper copy of it, but it tells you for whatever size wire that you have, how many amps you can pull in a particular column of temperature rating on that wire. So for residential, everything is gonna be in that first column, your 60 degrees Celsius column. That's the rating of your, of your terminals and wire overall picture. In general, things in, in, in house wiring are gonna be rated in that first column. So a number 14 wire can handle 15 amps. A number 12 wire can handle 20 amps. A number 10 wire can handle 30 amps. A number eight wire can handle 40 amps. A number six wire, 55 amps and so on. And then, you know, a main feeder wire coming to a panel, you know, you would be getting down into larger ones, you know. You know, um, One alt, two alt, three alt can handle, you know, 125 amps and so on. A four alt wire, 195 amps and so on. A 250 KC mill, when you get above the alts, it, they may start talking about KC mills, and that K is a thousand, and C mill is circular mills, so it's a thousand circular mills. So 250, uh, 250 KC mills, that size wire. Could handle 215 amps um, if it was residential. So, but for comp copper wire, you're going to be dealing with copper motion time. It's going to be one of these three columns here. One of those three columns. If your wire insulation, if, if the insulation on the wire is rated at some other temperature, you can use the other column to get an amp rate. But then that's going to be limited to. You can only use a higher amp rating for, for like a number 14. You know, you can, you can pull 20 amps on a number 14 wire in industrial type wire that has a, a different type of insulation on there, not, not, not residential wire, but you know, commercial or industrial. You make a pull 20 amps on a number 14 wire only if, if the insulation on the wire, if, 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 the, if the covering is rated for it, and if the terminals you're tying to on the breaker on both ends of that wire, if the terminals you tie to, if both ends are actually rated at, at that at that higher temperature, 75 Celsius or 167 Fahrenheit. So you've got to, the only way you can use these higher columns is if the, the insulation on the wire and the terminals you're tying to on both ends are rated at that temperature. And then you can pull 20 amps through a number 14 wire. So you say, well, how can you pull 20 through a number 14? It's because of this, look. The copper wire itself would, it is the number 14, right? The copper itself, not the insulation, the copper can handle, it can handle 15 amps or 20 or 25 amps. The copper itself can handle take 25 amps, but the insulation around the wire is the issue. You gotta have 
a higher grade insulation to be able to use those higher amp ratings. And then even if the wire can handle it, if the terminals you're tying to on the breaker can't handle it, guess what? You can't use that higher column. You gotta go back to the column that agrees with the temperature rating of the terminals that you tie to, okay? Now, that information is in, if, if you wanna dig into it, it's in um, article 110 in the code book. So you can go back to code book in here and flip by, I won't do it now because it's getting late. And, um, and uh, so another time we can look at it, but it's article 110 in the code book that tells you what I just said about terminal limitations. Um, so, um, so let's get out of the code book. Let's, let's uh, finish the chapter real quick here. And uh, go back to here. There, and um, I'm, I'm gonna bring this thing to a close really quick here. If, if, you don't have, if you don't have a GFCI receptacles where you're working out on a job or at home, you don't have them. Let's say if you're working on jobs and you're going place to place, like maybe working on hog farms or moving around in a plant and everywhere just doesn't have GFCI, but yet you're using these big old heavy power tools um, and, and you need GFCI protection. So what do you do? Um, if, if, if you can't put receptacles everywhere, just get this adapter here. Get the pigtail that's got that box on there with the GFCI built into that portable deal. So you can plug that into any receptacle and you have uh, the two, the, the test and reset buttons there and you get GFCI on, on that female there. So that's, that's what you do. You, you know, you can get them at Lowe's. The company you work for should be providing them um, and it can be a real lifesaver. Um, here, they're showing that the third prong is is necessary for grounding on equipment on 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 certain equipment. Now, if you happen to buy a, a power tool and it and it never had a ground on there like that one, then it's considered to be double insulated from the factory. And then UL underwriter lab underwriters laboratory does not require the manufacturer to put a ground terminal on there but it has to be a double insulated tool to, to qualify for that. Here, if you have a third prong there and it gets broken, now I'm gonna show you one right here, it's been broken if you look in the webcam. This has been broken off. Somebody's been gouging it like that and when they pull it out, then, then the ground terminal broke off in the receptacle. And, but here, if you get one like that, don't keep using it. Cut the end off like I did right there. I just cut the end of it off and you get another male plug at Lowe's for a couple bucks or even Walmart may even have them. But uh, it, it's a couple of dollars and it can save your life. If you don't have the ground prong in there, guess what? Then the metal parts of the equipment that you're using are not gonna be protected. So if the internal wiring, uh, hot wire inside of a drill happens to hit the frame of the drill and, and the drill is not, is not doesn't have the, the, the ground prong there, then the frame becomes energized and it becomes at a high potential, high voltage, and you can get killed. But if, if the ground prong is in there like that, and then you get a hot wire in the drill, a winding that shorts to the frame of the drill, what happens is the hot wire, it comes in contact with ground all of a sudden, and when it does, it draws a high amount of current really quick, and, and the breaker that's upstream actually trips nice and quick. So if you get a hot wire hitting the ground inside of a device or a cable, then the breaker is gonna do that number right there, okay? So that's the reason behind having the ground on equipment in place is so that if the hot wire hits that ground, you're gonna have a low resistance, high current. When the resistance goes down because of a direct contact to ground, there's no load in there. When you go from hot to ground, there ain't no load. So the ohms go way down to like almost nothing. So the current goes, tries to go infinite. And of course it can't, but it does exceed the rating on the breaker. So it's gonna throw the breaker like super quick. Okay. So, you, you know, that's why you need that grounding prong in there. Now the NFPA 70E is another code book that deals with safety in the workplace. So you can you can go online to that to the NFPA I just showed you 
And instead of choosing the 70 code book, choose the 70 E. And it's going to tell you about the electrical gloves, the face seals, the, the clothing, the art rated clothing you're supposed to have on. Um, it's going to tell you about a lot of things, you know, safety with ladders, scaffolds, all kind of stuff. Well, well I, I, let me back. Yeah, it, that stuff should be in there too. Anything electrical related in a workplace for safety in a workplace would be in that book. Um, and I, I got one of those too. Um, so OSHA is a part of the Department of Labor, and they are the ones that, that are the watchdogs to keep an eye on industry and, and uh, companies to make sure that they're keeping things safe for you as a worker. And if they don't, then they get violations and they get fines and they, they can be shut down. So they can come in unannounced and, and do visits. They've done it where I worked at years ago. They can just knock on the door. And um, and legally they can come in. And if you don't let them in, they'll go downtown and get a permit and come in. I've seen that happen too. I worked at one place years ago to where the manager wouldn't let them in. And they said, well, we'll be back. <laughs> and, they, and they did. He messed up there. They went downtown and got a permit, and they walked right on in, and then they really socked it to the company on, on some on some on, on some things. So um, they they can come in, and they will come in, and and they they're out to protect you. So um, lockout tagout is required. If you notice there, you can get lockout devices that go around mail plugs, individual breaker lockouts for branch circuits, so that you don't have to really cut the whole panel off. And then you have the hasp that can go around these large disconnect panels on disconnect boxes, like for motor controls and things like that, or main disconnects that have uh, multiple holes in there that guys, you got three or four guys working on the machine, everybody can put a lock on there individually on one hasp. And then everybody has to be done and take their locks off before the machine can be restarted. Your boots, gloves, helmets, and all that stuff. You know, the boots that I have on, they're electrical rated rated boots. So when you go to buy boots, you can look in the ton of the boot and you, you want to look look at them that says EH rated, electrical hazard rated. And so the toes in them are going to be like a composite material. They're going to have something special in there so that it would not be an electrical hazard that your boots. So I, I buy just Wolverines. They don't cost me but about $69, $79 when I buy them down here in a, a shoe show, one of these places by Walmart, and, and again, you can get them for around 70 bucks. You can put more in them, but get look in the tongue and make sure that it's EH rated for electrical hazard rated. But earplugs, not, you know, you just wear the PPE you're supposed to be wearing it. Now, if I had wore earplugs years ago, a lot of years ago, I would not have a ringing in my ears now. I mean, I kind of laughed at earplugs like most of us do. But you go enough years around punch presses and conveyors and things going on year after year after year. And then you, you begin to develop you know, a little background ringing going on and, and they don't really have a cure for that. So it's so I really should have wore earplugs way back. 22, when I first got into plants, way back in 80, 89, you know, 1989. And I wouldn't be dealing with that little, you know, that little background ringing. So... You can read the rest of the chapter. Um, if you see here, EH, EH means that the boots are approved for electrical work. Again, um, regular steel toed, don't get them if you're gonna be doing electrical work, get EH. They're, they, they are reinforced toes, but, 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 but they're electrical safe. Um, and I don't, buy, I don't buy $150 boots, you know, I buy, you know, $70 boots, you know. But they're Wolverine, but they are EH rated. Um, so they're just showing there, you know, some safe guidelines. Um, you know, be careful with jewelry. I don't, I don't wear metal rings. I've got a class ring. I don't wear it. I, I've got, I've got a gold watch. I got for being in a plant for 15 years. Okay, I don't wear it because I don't want to get electrocuted around my hand. I've got a plastic Casio watch or a plastic band there that I wear, you know, I don't wear metal necklaces, okay, so if you're doing electrical work, you need to, you need to be getting rid of the metal stuff off of you, because um, it's just something else that can go wrong, you know, long hair, you want to have it tied up, 
you want to have that stuff out of the way. Um, fall protection, y'all can read this on your own. The, depending on where you are, you got you can read the guidelines in there. And let me just say this. I've got a worksheet here in Moodle for, for this chapter. It's pretty lengthy, and uh, but it, it's, it's, it's important stuff. So the worksheet here, it's in Moodle. You're going to do it electronically. It's the same thing I'll be giving you on paper. And it, it, it covers the entire chapter, including things about uh, scaffolds and ladders and all that. So if you will, um, as soon as you can, you know, begin working on it and try to stay up on your worksheet. The good thing about this is you can work on it kind of any time. And um, so I haven't set um, deadlines on, on it yet, but as we get into the semester, I'll have to start setting some deadlines in at some point. So, but um, you know, you have a body harness there that you tie off if you're gonna be, you know, so high in the air. And uh, just read through all that. This is guidelines on properly lifting things. Read through that. There's questions in the worksheet about that that you'll need to answer. Ladders, you want to be using, uh, don't use metal ladders, use fiberglass. And be looking at guidelines on do's and don'ts, you know. You know, you want to have an extension ladder three foot above the roof if you're going to be getting off on the roof and getting back off, you know. Um, and those are so dangerous. I mean, I know people, uh, two guys that fell off a roof within, within the last year. One guy broke his back, you know, and, um, and one guy almost broke his back. And, um, and I almost broke my back one time uh, coming off of, a, off of a mobile home. And I said, man, gosh, you know, so you need to have somebody really at the bottom of that ladder um, if you can. Please do that. Um, the, and the, the distance at the bottom needs to be a quarter of the length of the ladder, you know. So if you're 16 foot high, you need to be four foot out is, is, is the uh, recommended angle. Don't use a step ladder for uh, leaning against the wall. Don't stand on the top step. Uh, scaffolds, you know, read through that stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of guidelines in there. Uh, tool safety, so on, you know. Don't use line man pliers as a hammer because it may chip. It may chip the pliers, ping, and it may, you know, I'll hit you. Safety data sheets. Um, everything like uh, PVC glue, um, lubricants. Everything has a safety data sheet that tells you the hazards and what do you do if you get it in your eye? What What do you do if you get it on your skin? And it, it tells you numbers to call. You know, uh, if you if you get exposed in a, in a bad way, um, in any way, and it tells you the temperature limits on things, um, so that you you're not going to expose things to a, 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 a heat risk of having a fire. You know, for certain things that, that are flammable, um, and that's and then uh, for uh, the, the fire triangle to have a fire and sustain a fire, you got to have a fuel heat source and oxygen. If you take one of those three out, then you extinguish the fire. And that's really the basis of the fire extinguisher is you, you get rid of the oxygen in, in the fire and then and you stop the fire. So that's that's what is behind fire extinguishers. Um, there's different classes of fire extinguishers. Generally, an ABC type works is the best because it'll handle wood, grease, and electrical. Electrical is the C type. But an ABC extinguisher will do all three. They, they do make a D that's for flammable metals, like for magnesium and, and metals, special metals that might be in a machine shop. So there's a D type for that. And you know, you read through there, and there's questions in the worksheet about, you know, uh, it's going to ask you what kind of use in what environment. They do make different styles. So be careful what you put down. Um, if you haven't had fire extinguisher training to read this, you pull the pin at the top and then you aim at the base of the fire and then you, you sweep, squeeze and sweep. So pull the pin, aim at the base, squeeze the handle and then sweep side to side. It's good to get some training. Um, and that's it, okay. So I'm gonna end the session here and um, again, uh,
once a week I'm going to put something in here that you can watch kind of at, 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 your, at your time and do, do the worksheet. And um, so thanks for joining. And you have a blessed evening, and uh, thanks again for taking the class. And uh, I enjoyed the first night with, with you guys a lot. You, you guys are really, I think you get some go-getters. I believe you are. And once you get downstream into the class of ways, if any of you are looking part-time work, I know a contract that will probably put you to work if, if you're interested, so part-time. But thanks again, and, uh, and ha God bless you. Have, 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 a, have a nice evening, and, uh, and I'll see you um, tomorrow night.